Mr. Bond, if you could lead us, please. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will start our public hearing at 5.39 p.m. 6.1, Learning Continuity mm -hmm. and Attendance Plan. Can you guys hear me? You're good. Okay. So, good evening, board. Um, I'm here to present on behalf of our rest of the learning continuity plan that the gentleman has put out here. Piece of work. Normally, this plan, normally, uh, we compile and put together what we know, what we normally know as the LCAP. So, the learning continuity and attendance plan is taking place as the LCAP. Um, today is the first read. Um, the, part, the purpose of today is to uh, present the plan, collect feedback from community board members, um, and then throughout this week, collect feedback from other stakeholders, edit the document, revise it, and then um, come for approval next week. So, a big piece of the plan is uh, stakeholder engagement opportunities and providing stakeholders with opportunities to. Um, help you provide input, help get things are going, um, and then we make adjustments based on the data that we collected. On the first slide is all of the stakeholder engagement opportunities that we as a board have provided for this year. So then what we do is we take the stakeholder uh, feedback, we look for trends, we do a root cause analysis of what some of the trends are indicating, and then we drive our decision making based on those trends. So the um, five trends that we were able to pull out and, and do some root cause analysis on were accelerate and access to learning. And I'm just going to share some staff pieces that I thought felt important to call out. Um, on August 24th, we did a distance learning survey. 96.7 of the responses indicated that they're currently engaging in distance homework. Um, and then the next question is in regards to internet access. Right now, 61, 61.9% of our parents responded that they're currently accessing our first grade history hotspot. 33% reported not needing a hotspot. And that leaves about 6% needing one and not having it yet. Uh, so those 6%, uh, we then dug down and saw who those, who those students were, and those were the students that were really kind of driven and like out and we start with out in the uh, surrounding areas that probably made it to some of the neighborhoods to the attention hotspot for, and uh, what we did was start to do and get those families set up and place them. <laughs> Engaging learning environment, there was lots of concerns about the amount of face time that students received in the spring and the level of engagement. <laughs> Instruction, we want to, to see what the what parents were rating our engagement levels um, through any of our programs. And a scale from one to five is the engagement of our program. We asked, how can we increase the amount of learning? The top four responses provided were increase the amount of face to face time, assign more challenging work to make students, provide work at my students' level, and increase in person opportunities. The next um, trend we, we saw or uh, noticed was school connectedness. Um, so we asked parents, what do you see as opportunities the district can provide to increase school connectedness? You know, what can we do? Um, one was to facilitate activities that are similar to a regular school year. And the other was opportunities for peer, for them to have peer-to-peer -peer contact. Um, 
and not necessarily an instructional matter, more an explicit one for us. So I know that um, all of our principals are working on coming up with some solutions to, to that feedback. Social emotional needs on the distance learning survey conducted um, counseling services um, were some of the requests. So the top four counseling topics um, that parents requested was social skills, organizing their daily schedule, self-regulation, and positive decision making at home. And then 48 percent of our respondents also indicated they would like to see some services after the instructional time. So not necessarily during the instructional day, but after Last time, and remember, stakeholders consist of our parents, they consist of our, uh, of our staff as well. So on a survey conducted in July, 95% of our teachers who agreed surveyed indicated that they would participate in professional development targeted to their learning and expertise. Um, and then also indicated that what they, the devices that they were using currently in the spring were not capable of, of um, providing effective Learning. Um, there's three phases to our plan. We're currently in phase one, um, where we're, we're all in distance learning. Um, phase two would consist of a hybrid model in which we have uh, an AB schedule or somehow decrease the number of students in each classroom. And then phase three would be all of our students returning um, back to the classroom. We had to identify actions related to in-person learning and we had to tie dollar amounts um, to that, to those actions. So some of the actions that, that we call out in related to, to making in-person learning successful is we would need to increase custodial hours for part-time employees. Um, the Mercer County Department of Public Health um, has a lot of sanitation requirements associated. Um, and so uh, increasing custodial hours, especially in the evenings, so that we can make sure that we're sanitizing each classroom, every device, um, manipulative policies. And we need to continue to provide professional development, especially targeted to learning loss. Create, create outdoor learning environments. So we have these beautiful solar um, coverings. And one of, the, one of the areas that we spend funds on is um, creating learning environments that outside make them safer for our students. Um, so cementing under the DPE and Bryant Middle School solar panels and finishing those projects and creating a learning, uh, like an outdoor classroom. Purchase and secure uh, PPE and safety barrier, safety materials. Purchase cameras for instructional delivery. So that would be like webcams um, that either follow the teacher or like cams that um, would video the camera, video the teacher while instructing. Um, purchase dual desks at DPE and one, mark, one classroom at Marsh Elementary. So one of the requirements is our students have to be six feet apart. Um, one of the classrooms at Marsh and all the classrooms at Marsh Health Elementary have team desks. So two students can be sitting in each desk. In order for students to be six feet apart, that's just, we, have, we don't have enough desks and the desks that we do have aren't gonna be conducive to that learning. Um, and so, we work that into the plan. Increased health clerk hours to address increased need. So every every um, school site has to have an isolation room. This isolation room can only be manned by a nursing staff. Um, has to have certain requirements. Um, some of our school sites only have nursing staff on them for five hours a day, and so we would need someone to be there the same hours as the students are there. So for um, some of our sites, our nursing staff is only on campus for four hours. So if the day was five hours, we would increase by four and a half. Um, purchase or lease a portable at Marsh Elementary. Marsh Elementary um, has an increased um, student enrollment. There's um, more students in their classroom at DPE. There's about 21 to about 24 students in a classroom. At Marsh, you're looking anywhere from 24 to 27 in a classroom. So in order to possibly have in-person learning, we might have to um, a teacher to be able to take the excess students that we wouldn't be able to physically um, handle, and 
and then we need a spot to fill the space for it. That's, and that's a little in the news that uh, since we might be able to target that spot, so we can use the money for that. Um, pay for extracurricular stipends to address school connectivity. So if we um, if we do offer stipends this school year, um, we can use COVID funds to um, pay for those stipends that we do offer um, because we can tie that to the school connectivity, social emotional support, and peer interaction. And then that would release some money in our budget. The next area is a phase related to distance learning. Um, currently, we're all in distance learning. Um, our preschool left off elementary in March um, direct instruction through uh, Zoom. The primary platforms at preschool and first grade is Kickstarter, um, second grade, um, and, and through fifth grade is using Google Classroom. Um, there's many other platforms and supplemental platforms that all of our um, sites are using, but those are the primary consistent platforms we have. Um, secondary right, and high school are a Zoom contact with first grade and secondary period, and the platforms Bryant's using Google Classroom, high school is using Google Classroom and Canvas. Our, our, our alt ed programs um, con do Zoom contact daily, and they use Google Classroom and Coursera. And so additional academic supports for all of our students uh, are our instructional aids being pushed into the classroom. So in Zoom, we do breakout sessions. So the, the instructional period might start with all of our students with the teacher and then breaking out to decrease the size um, where maybe our instructional aid takes five, 10 students, our teacher takes another 10 students to decrease the amount of students being provided support. Um, after hours instructional support, so this hasn't happened yet, um, but the next level of work is starting some homework hotlines, after hours instructional support, maybe Saturday, um, Saturday tutoring, whatever that looks like, um, the sites will, the leadership teams on each site will start having those conversations around what we can offer, but it's good to put in our plan that we can use this money for. Um, technology and then resource finders. So then our actions related to distance learning um, provide professional development and planning time for teachers. Um, we provided three days professional development, but still feel the need um, for some planning time, especially if this is a um, long-term model, and our teachers are really going to need, need some planning time to continue to plan for next year. Um, we purchased supplemental platforms. So at the beginning of the year, each leadership team and grade level teams and departments looked at their, their core curriculum and looked for, you know, what does the core curriculum offer online? What are some of the gaps that we're seeing that can't be provided um, this during um, virtual learning? And how do we fill those gaps? So that's when we purchase supplemental materials that we've already approved, ISL, accelerated readers, Scholastic, Function Canal, and some of the ones that we've done already. Uh, we purchased a laptop for every teacher. This has already been distributed. We purchased and contacted the providers for hotspots. Um, tonight, um, Hyundai is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, 1340D LTE cell towers um, as a long term solution for our internet. Um, we purchased Zoom Cloud, Teams on Canvas, which are our consistent primary platform. Um, resource finders in the springtime, one of the consistent feedback we were provided is that our low income families might not have a laptop or technology to be able to receive the communications of what the community resources are uh, for what we offer as a district. So we provided a district learning resource or a distance learning district resource finder, um, and that went out at the first week of the end of our season. Um, and it had district resources as well as site specific resources. Um, and then we're pur we've purchased and will continue to purchase and implement food uh, brown paper bags.
If there's no questions or comments, thank you, Mrs. Grijalva. And that's all reimbursable, correct? Correct. That's right. Again? Oh, unless they do, they will. If there's no additional questions or comments, we'll close the public hearing at 6 p.m. Seven point one communication and or volume is down. Is your volume up on your computer? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I see you. Uh, I have every, okay. can you hear me? I have everything up. Can you speak closer to your computer? Sure. Can you hear me now? I still don't hear her. I heard her before, but I don't hear her now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. What's going on? No, we can not. not working. Um, can you guys hear me? I no, can hear no. you, Pat. Okay, so she can hear me. That's weird. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. If there's no other questions, we will close the public hearing. 7.1, communications and or public comments. Public concerns will be heard by the board at this time. However, they will not be discussed. Policy number 9323 limits individuals presentation to three minutes. The president may extend the time under certain circumstances. This is the opportunity for members of the public to focus on issues important to the district's purpose of education. Under board policy, this time may not be used to present derogatory information of a personal nature on any employee. Members of the public who wish to address the board must speak from the podium and identify themselves. Public comment. Okay, 8.1 RFP cell towers. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Moved by Mr. O'Banion, second by Mr. Mraz. Dr. Miller or Mr. Lee? Bill, we're talking about the towers now. Okay, got it. All right, so this, uh, good evening, everyone. This uh, RFP basically is a request for proposal for uh, cell towers at five R school sites and an additional optional one at the Washington Carver Head Start on Reynolds Avenue. Um, this will increase our Wi-Fi for our students and our staff uh, in our town. It has a possibility of giving about a one mile radius with the, I revert my take wing. Okay. Uh, it has a possibility of course of uh, basically sending this Wi-Fi signal across the town for about a good mile a uh, half a mile to a mile radius. And so the reason for the five cell towers is basically to get as much density as, as you can possibly with the Wi-Fi. Um, uh, the I got two quotes back in terms of initial estimates when I first started this uh, research. Um, a town of our size should be right around uh, a million was, was the, the quotes. Uh, the upload and download speeds are right around uh, in the RFP are right around, we're asking about 10 megs down and about five megs up. So a little bit better than our current AT&T and Verizon hotspots.
The goal also is to have them train our staff for about a year, and that's part of the RFP. And then it also will um, uh, kind of uh, they'll train us for about a year. They kind of leave it in our hand to to do the troubleshooting and all that good stuff. So there is also training and also tech support along the way, all uh, within this RFP. And could you talk a little bit about um, how uh, we intend to pay? Yeah, we we do intend to pay it. And correct me if I'm wrong, there, Miss Gilpinski, but we do intend to pay this with the learning loss mitigation funds. Totally reimbursable. Yes, sir. Um, I thought when we first started talking about these towers, we had a four-mile radius. And yeah, that was down to a mile. Yeah. That was the original, uh, and those would be more costly than the current uh, proposal. And the reason for that was they, they were not on the uh, public band radio frequency. Those were more on the um, the, the high frequency, if I think of the word, um, microwave shots. And that would be more costly than this situation here. So do you really think that it's worth it for half a mile to a mile radius for the I, amount of money we're going to spend? It's four miles from here to the Y. I well, think we're going to spread them out. We're not going to get very much coverage. I obviously we're going to get the the town. Um, there will be still certain pockets. If you're out in the outskirts, let's say past, uh, I think past Russell, or or you know certain areas, we're still going to have to go back to the hotspots. There's just certain areas where these radio frequencies will not reach because we don't have the fiber laid there. So this is basically to pick up the dead spots that we can't get with the hotspots. That this is to get basically the town, yeah, to get basically the town. For those that are not within the town, within the, or close or on the outskirts, we'll have to still stick with the at t or Verizon hotspots. So also, there's one thing to mention is that, so there'll be one at Bryant, so that area within a mile radius. And so then George Christian, so in South radius. Palace, within a mile radius of that one. Or half mile. And then Dos Palace High School within a mile of that one. There are spots like the Y for instance where it's it's too far away from and correct me if I'm wrong it's too far away from the network and so, so um, that's why those folks and like I said I'll probably cover about 90 percent of our students but like Pajay mentioned there will be pockets of folks that will uh, students that will need to provide thumb draw or the the hot spots to but um, but in the grand scheme of things 90 percent is is pretty good so basically here in town, around the high school, we get good service with the hotspots. And Bryant and South Dos Palos. I mean, right now we do, right? I mean, and basically in town, we should have no problem getting service with the hotspots. But these wouldn't require hotspots though. No, but why are we gonna waste a tower here when we don't need to? Because it's $30,000 a month. When we can put it somewhere else. We're, we're paying that monthly fee right now. Yeah. We're we wouldn't paying. have to pay that monthly fee. And we're on somebody else's network. Right now we're paying $40,000 a month. And this, this, this the CARES money is reimbursable. So it's really not, it's our money, but it's basically an opportunity to um, service the students that we have without using hotspots and having towers. And so it would save us in the long term. Okay. And on top of that, address an immediate need that we have. I guess it's just disappointing going from four miles to a mile to maybe half a mile. It just... He didn't say half mile. I think he said mile, mile and a half, right? Yeah. Oh, mainly mile the, to mile and a half? He yeah. said mile. He said mile was that basically most of my uh, most vendors gave me about a mile. Uh, keep in mind that as Dr. Mentioned, uh, Dr. Miller mentioned as well, think of this in the long term, right? Think about this five, ten years down the road. You have Wi-Fi for your town for a whole good at least. This is future-proofing your town for a good five, ten years. These kids in this district now have the ability to do homework at home on this on these school Wi-Fi access points. No longer will you be, you know, when you do give out homework that's, you know, that at, at home or or off at, off the instructional time or day, kids can go to their school site and ask for these these school, uh, you know, sponsored hotspots, if you will, and take advantage of that. So it's a, it's a very good long-term project. I guess maybe I misunderstood at the beginning. Because I thought when it was first brought to us, the towers were to get us out where the hot spots won't reach, to help the kids out there where we can't get them hot spots and get service. So maybe I just misunderstood from the beginning. Mr. Mr. Lee, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Bonds, I I agree with you. I believe that that's what I understood that these towers were going to get 
us service to where we currently don't have it or the hotspots don't provide. So that is my recollection of the original conversation, number one. Number two, so if we still have to have a certain amount of hotspots in order to cover these places, what will the fee be then? I mean, I'm sure it won't be the thirty or $40,000 fee because it will be minimal, but what will the expense be then? And third, can you just repeat how much faster you said it was going to be because it just didn't sound like it was going to be that much bigger of speed or coverage, if you would, for the million dollars. Sure, and maybe maybe I, I might have uh, you know uh, said it in the wrong terms, but I, I thought when we first discussed this, the, it was the idea that obviously we'll get those pockets around the Brighton area, which right now are definitely dead spots. So you know, with the 18 hot T hotspots, that solved that. Also, as uh, some of you guys mentioned, the South Dallas Palace area, a mile radius gets a lot. It also gets part of the Oral Loma area as well. And so that's that's getting a lot of the, the, the students. I don't have, uh, and I'm pretty sure it's close to what Dr. Miller said, it's probably a 90% or higher in terms of the getting all of our students. Uh, so if we take that and let's say we have about a good 10%, right, that need at t hotspots or Verizon hotspots. So just to basically take, uh, you know, I don't see it more than a, Two or three thousand, maybe even four thousand dollar a month hotspot fee. If we were to go to something like this, just take ten percent of what we're currently paying, and then just reduce that by ten percent. You know, multiply that by ten percent would be my guesstimate of the numbers. Um, and in terms of the speeds, there, Miss Davis, 10, 10 megabits down for any uh, radio frequency is very good, um, and, and five anywhere from four to five uh, up speed is very good. It's better than what we are currently getting with our AT and T Verizon hotspots now. Oh, okay, I see. I see your hands, um, Mr. Moraz. Um, my question is: Here in town, I believe we are 2.5 radius. Do you actually have kind of like a graph showing where we will be able to to hit? It would help us visualize this a lot more. Sure. So in the RFP on the last exhibit, and I could pull it here. Yeah, because the visual is going to make it much yeah. easier than us guessing who's sure. covering who's. Sure, sure. And you said one is an optional tower over at the Carver Center. Is that optional tower included in the $1 million fee already, or are we going to have an up fee on that if we include that tower? That, that's, uh, that's a great question. It's already included. And the reason why, why I did that was because even though I got the uh, confirmation or okay from their board president, I wanted to see that as an optional price just in case, but that was already included in my, my estimates from the vendors. Okay, because that would cover the Midway population, which is a very large population, the Christian yep. Holmes population, and then our South Dallas Palace Tower would be at George Christian School, which would actually cover what South we call Dos South Dos Palace. Mm -hmm. yep. We saturate Dos Palace when we're talking it's one, two, three, four, and then our fifth tower. We once talked about it being over at the Santa Rita area, but that is no longer a viable option due to us not having the bandwidth over there. Is that what I understood correctly? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the Santa Rita area there. The Santa Rita area would be the, the Y. The Y, oh, yeah. gotcha. It's okay. too far, the Y is too far away. And I think also, yeah. if you guys recall, when we initially talked about towers, we talked about channels mm -hmm. and, and that's a different level of frequency if I'm yeah. not that's mistaken. Correct. And that price tag was about 2.5 million. And so that's why, you know, and you compete with those channels with companies and, and things like that. Um, this is, again, just allowing 4G community Wi-Fi for our students in our community and not necessarily our own channels. Um, but we still have our own channel, it's still community Wi-Fi through the school district, but you know, it's kind of a different, it's apples and oranges when you talk about that level of service and there's a, there's a dollar amount difference as well. So with the mile coverage, will our towers overlap? Uh, the, with the mile coverage, they will, should. but we, they do have the equipment to basically send out that same radio frequency and it will basically just pick up the closest one. I mean, if I, we have a tower here, out in South Dos Palace, here at the high school, are they going to overlap? Oh, I, I get what you said. Are they going? 
are they going to bleed where they get enough coverage? Yes. Is that, if that's what your question, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Uh, Arias. Right now they have the ATT hotspots, which uh, parents have reported to me that they work well. If that's the only population of students that we serve or maybe a handful of outlying areas, then we definitely have plenty. Pause, Jay. Yes. All of these fees are reimbursable. reimbursable. Right? The million dollars is reimbursable. The million dollars will be reimbursable yeah. as, our, as will our hotspot fees. The only yes. difference is, and this is all said and done, the hotspots will go away. We will still have these towers. <laughs> we will yep. now own these towers versus mm -hmm. paying a rental fee on a month to month. Yep. On a hot spot. If this were to happen yeah. again, so, or or just in general, I mean, I would general, imagine, our, yeah, our students would have all access to internet in the long run versus the short term. You're paying a month to month fee with a hot spot. The 30 days after you've made your payment are forty thousand dollars. We're paying another again, forty thousand dollars. We make this one million dollar payment, which is going to be reimbursed back to us. We will now own this system, and it will be good. Ajay, I don't mean to quote you, but you said five to ten years, correct? Yes. I'd yes, rather they, take the five to ten year yeah. plan than I would the thirty day plan for forty thousand dollars. Either which way, the money is reimbursed back to us, and we will own this Wi-Fi system for the students of Dallas Palace. It would just be like in the classroom, walk in, you know, requirements, etc. Turn this device on. Extension. That's correct. The, the great thing about this program is our kids with their current Google accounts or AD accounts can log in just like they log in at school. So it's the same user experience. And just here I am thinking five, 10 years for a town this size. You ever get something like this? I just, I don't know. I just, I think this would be like the Cadillac version, dream come true, uh, you know, for given that there's federal funds that are gonna assist with this and we're gonna get reimbursed as well. I just think this is an opportunity that you got to strike when, when the iron's hot, as, as you will, if you will. Okay. Yes, I, it, am I correct in saying that there'll be the same internet filters and all that kind of stuff as our current system? So the parents, I mean, we're, we're doing this for the kids in our district, for their for home, to make sure that they're staying connected, right? Yes, this, and the same, they're still going to be, they're not going to be able to be surfing the web, their parents aren't going to be using it. That we can control. Now, I, I understand what yeah. some of the stuff that's been going on. Yeah. It is a moving target continuously, right? Every time we put up a filter, somebody's trying to find a way to get by it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I understand that. But the general idea is it's still going to be a safe, the, the safest we can make it. Yep. The great, the great thing about this is the Verizon hotspots, 18 hotspots, we have no control of their filters, right? With this, it goes through our system. It goes through our filters. It goes through our firewall. And so before, every time a kid logs in, just think of them like they're logging at school. And they're going through our filters before they get out to the, the World Wide Web. And so a lot more uh, features, if you will, to blockade them before they can actually do that. And so, yeah, it is on our network. All these towers basically will be uh, piping back through our network out to the real world. And so we have way more control of this situation versus the 18 hot, or the Verizon hotspots, yes. Uh, yeah. I think as a board, we need to assume that we're not going to get that money, that million dollars. If we don't get that million dollars reimbursed to us, can we afford to pay for it? Because nothing's guaranteed in our hands. And we're going to spend a million dollars if we And we all know the condition states in. We need to make sure that we can cover that before we go and make a decision. Ms. is there any, have you heard any? Thing associated with the reimbursable totals that have already been allocated to us. Anything associated with that not coming to us? Are 
these funds state or the federal funds reimbursed? This is federal money that's already allocated to districts. And I think that's where Mr. Gore, Mr. Bond was and, state and funds. Is this is the same thing that Patterson federal, is doing, correct? Federal yes. money. Patterson is getting 10. Yes. Yes. <laughs> contacted Patterson Unified, they contacted Desert Sands. The Desert Sands uh, Unified School District has basically no, no. competed theirs and in talking to them, they have no issues. They love it. They, they love the program, of course, and they did um, use, they, they were in our situation, they did theirs a couple years back, and so they didn't have federal funds. They used their own funds to get this done, but in talking to their tech director, talking to their uh, uh, purchasing director, they, they love the program. They, they, they thought it went well. It's a very similar program to this. As Dr. Mentioned, uh, Dr. Miller mentioned, this is the citizen band radio frequency situation. So it is a free public uh, radio frequency that we hop on. Before they actually do any work, they'll do a survey of all the companies around the area just to make sure that nobody else is on that frequency before they tap into that frequency. So think of it like our own private, but also public frequency, if you will. Yeah, yes, Bill, she said that she did. this is part of the federal uh, reimbursable funds. Now, this is the reason why we can do the Washington Department of is because we already have Merced County Office and their their fiber lines, their cable lines have already are already there. So all they're doing basically is adding antennas to the site for us to go all the way to the Y. We have the trench fiber out there. We have to get cable out there to mean, get the antenna. Awesome. So you're saying you picked up the signal out there? Yeah. So you're probably picking up a signal from like a Ryzen or a ATT tower, one of those towers. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're you're getting a what's called a. Yeah. So you're picking up quantum. Yeah. Mr. Lee. Yeah, we're on. You think we're paying like 30, 40. 40. So a little bit normal after Christmas break, we're at 120, 160,000 for hot pots. Yeah, it's a six month contract. Yeah, that's about right. So about uh, 200. 200,000 versus in a million dollars. I mean, this is five to 10 years out, though. We still going to, we still going to need, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, five to 10 years from now where kids can, they don't need a hotspot. They don't need their home Wi-Fi. Their parents don't, this is a, a, basically parents don't need to purchase Wi-Fi for their children at home anymore. They can log in to their school account and complete assignments and things like that without their parents purchasing the internet for like the next five to 10 years. This, this is an investment this, that we can make while using hopefully federal dollars, federal funds that are allocated to us. That, that we could. This is an opportunity for us to 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 invest in the community for the kids and give them that Wi-Fi at a time when you say Patterson pays right out of pocket. We're supposed to get reimbursed for it. So it's, I mean, you, that's the way I look at it. As I mean, it's, we get reimbursed. That's a, that's a, the greatest deal. If you don't get reimbursed, it's still an investment in our kids' education for the future. So it's not. I look at it past this year. It's a win-win. Because these towers aren't going to be up and running until when? May. I think that your plan said. Well, we're going to try for an aggressive timeline. I'm trying to get this done by January. If we get approved and we go through the process, that is a very aggressive timeline. But the goal is to make sure that timeline also coincides with our learning loss mitigation funds. So, so beyond the distance learning plan, we get back in school. It still, in my opinion, would be a beneficial thing for our students, for our community. Yep. Mr. Government to pay for it at the same time. Mr. Lee, then. Maintenance on the towers. Do you have any kind of number? I mean, I'm sure there's going to be tower maintenance for the next five or 10 years. Do you have any number on what the maintenance cost will be on the towers? That, that's a great question, Ms. Davis. I, I reached out to Desert Sands and they said that they've had theirs up for three years. It's very low maintenance. They basically, in this RFP, I basically injected all the maintenance, the repair, and the, the support, all that good stuff for that first year 
just to make sure we're good. Um, when I, in reaching and in talking to Desert Sands, I said it was very little. Um, and then when they do need a repair, it's just think of it like your electrician coming out to, to fix this wire, that, that wire, that cable that kind of deal. It's, it's very little maintenance. And just to clarify, this is, this reimbursement is federally reimbursed, not state reimbursed. Is that correct? That's correct. And do we have any idea of if, and I'm sorry if I didn't hear, do we have any idea of a federal reimbursement schedule? We do not know, no. So it could be one year, five years, six months. Well, so do you want to sit over here and talk? You have to spend it to get reimbursed. They're not gonna give it to us to spend. We have to spend it and then get reimbursed. Hi. Mrs. Kopinski, thank you. I I understand we have to spend it to get it back, but let's say we spend it tomorrow. What what kind of time frame are they giving us for these reimbursements? They 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 haven't given any timeline, but it's good that we've started to report our expenses. So that is already in place. If it runs along the federal management program of other cash programs that's a quarterly basis that we report and then they would send out a reimbursement based on the expenses reported quarterly. quarterly. Okay, so currently this, this CARES money is taking care of this $40,000 hotspot cost, is that correct? Currently we are tracking all of our learning loss mitigation funds and coding them to these learning loss resources. And as we report the expenses, the dollars should be coming in. So at this point, what would you say we have reported in what time frame, and have we received any of that, that money back? So we have our first report due on one of our resources on the 14th on Monday. And I will be reporting that we've spent 200 and 50 ish thousand dollars of that resource. They've not asked for reporting on any of the other resources yet. Okay. And those are the expenses we've spent from March to December 30th of last year. March. Okay. Thank you. Bill, do you have any other questions? No, I'm good. Are there any other questions? Okay. If there's no additional questions, um, I will call for the vote and I will go one by one. Um, Mrs. Arias. Yeah. Mr. Chase. Yes. Mr. Bonds. Yeah. Mr. O'Banion. Yes. Mr. Van Worth. You're up, Bill. Yes. Yes. Mr. Moraz. I'm sorry, Mr. Moraz. Is Miss, I can't see Mr. Moraz, is he a yes? Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Davis would like further discussion, but we'll vote no. And it passes. Eight point two elementary schools safe return to school plan 2020 2021. I need a motion and a second. 
Moved. Moved by Mr. Bonds, second by Mr. O'Banion. Dr. Miller. So I have, uh, there's actually really good news on the potential, uh, the possibility of reopening schools. Um, I have got word on Wednesday yeah. that, uh, that they are going to start processing reopening waivers on a hybrid model. Um, and kind of keeping yeah. the uh, 16 to, I think it was, yeah, 14 to two rate or 16, um, basically teachers and students in a classroom at one time. And so um, we have a reopening plan that we had um, that we discussed with uh, teachers um, and school staff um, back in the summer. Um, however, there's been different guidance that has come out um, recently uh, that uh, has changed over time. And it seems like there's a couple handful of things that change. Before there was two to three feet in classrooms. Now there's back to six. Um, before it was, you know, if you could fit that many students in the classroom, then you could keep um, those number of students in the classroom based on the, the, the spacing. Um, but with six feet apart, that's why they're moving to a hybrid model um, and they're, they're starting to process. And, and part of the reason that they're processing the waivers now, elementary waivers only, is because the uh, numbers have come down. Uh, the, uh, the basically the, the positivity rate has come down. It's below 8%. Um, we're at 7.5% right now. And so um, after uh, the elementary waivers would potentially, if we submitted ours on Monday or tomorrow afternoon or, or whenever we submit, um, then what happens after that, they would, um, the basically the, the Merced County Health Department would then turn to basically submit it to the state for the state approval, and then it would come back, um, I would imagine a couple of weeks time. And then um, after that approval, we would be able to open up our two elementary schools in a hybrid model. And so um, the plan that you have um, in front of you that's on the, the agenda it basically goes through the original plan that we had before, but it's a little bit more concise with a couple of changes. Like I said, the two to three feet now is, is back at six feet um, in classrooms. Um, but you can kind of see if you read through. Um, and again, there's a lot of kind of details um, in this, but basically we would have an A and B cohort. And basically the A students um, would come on Monday, and this is hypothetical because we don't know which day, um, but we would have like a, a Monday and then B students, the other half of the class would come um, on a Tuesday. Wednesday would be kind of a distance learning day, and then the A would come Thursday, and then the B would come back the follow the, that next Friday. You know, that's a hypothetical. What day ends up being the day that's distance learning or uh, asynchronous learning, if you will, um, is kind of up to us and our team. And we, like I said, have a great relationship and discussions with our teachers and, and school staff. And so that'll kind of be kind of a consensus item that we'll discuss. Um, but uh, but a lot of the, um, the items within this plan are really strictly around safety. Um, and uh, our school nurse has looked through all these plans and she's also been a collaborator on these plans. She's on the, uh, the Wednesday call with the health department with me every Wednesday. Um, and we ask questions and, and kind of go through um, kind of updates on how we were doing in the county, uh, how was, uh, you know, the, the positivity rates and things like that. So um, anyway, going through this, I, I don't want to go through the, the plan itself because like I said, it's about 13 pages and there's a lot of minutia in there. Um, but we do have the ability, like I said, we've already went through the hybrid plan. We do have the ability to, to submit a waiver. Doesn't mean it's gonna get approved. Um, we do have all the chat boxes checked that they're requesting. And so we do have the ability to submit on Monday. Um, but again, it has to go be checked off by them, by the health department. They could take it back to us and they might have some recommendations. Um, and then we would make our, rec our changes and then submit it back. But then, like I said before, it would need to go to the health department. They would sign off on it, go to the state. The state would then review it, sign off on it or not sign off on it. And then when it came back to us, um, then we would you know, start to begin to have a discussion about, not discussion about bringing kids back, but starting getting the fine details about um, transportation. 
um, start to talk about, uh, you know, and in this, in the meantime, the next week or two, we're going to start contacting elementary students um, to see, you know, before school started, we had about a 20% rate of students and parents that wanted to stay home, that wanted their children to stay home um, during this time. And so now that some time has passed, we want to check in with them again. And so we're going to call all of our elementary students and, um, and, you know, check in with them, see if they want to come back to school, if they've changed their mind, um, and then, uh, again, get that in writing uh, for them to, to come back. And so uh, the most important thing is safety, and we discussed that before, but um, it's really about our, our elementary plan is really extremely safe because the number of kids that stay in the same classroom all day, um, and then on top of that, you're going to have a reduced number of students in those classes um, daily. So the max is 16. Uh, people in a classroom daily. So, um, questions? What would the student marks elementary school? It's DPE and marks. It would be, it's technically three to six, uh, or excuse me, K6, pre TK6, but with having the two elementary schools, that's really our focus. And having a, a school like Bryant that had um, like sixth grade students with, you know, distance learning going on and just, it, it, would, it would be too difficult. And so right now we're really focused on these two schools, um, really getting good at that piece of it and making sure that, there's, that things are safe. And then we can start to look to branch out and, and look at other opportunities that, that might be there. So I think that, you know, it's really, like I said, we're doing the groundwork right now. Um, and that's, like I said, getting this plan together. Um, there's, like I said, a bunch of requirements that are associated with the plan. This is just the plan itself. But there's a bunch of other requirements that we've already completed. Um, and then that way we'll be able to submit on Monday. But then again, we need to contact parents. Um, we, need to contact, we need to find out which number, how many students are gonna come back. And so like, if, for instance, if I'm a third grade teacher, and 50% of my students want to stay home. And then somebody else is a third grade teacher and only 10% of their students want to stay home. And so there's probably going to need to be a, some balancing potentially um, if those situations should occur. And so there's a lot of planning on the back end and a lot of discussions that need to take place with staff and, and uh, it's a process. Um, but I would say that like I said, before we get information back, which I would assume maybe two to three weeks potentially. Um, there's going to be a lot of dialogue, a lot of meetings in preparation for it when we get approved, and that's the kind of mentality is when we get approved. And what are we, gonna, you know, what, what are the the kind of minutia details? These are the safety plans generally, but then what does it look like logistically at Marks, and what does it look logistically at DPE? Because that's going to be different because they're two different camp school sites and they have different ages. You're going to expect things differently from a kindergarten student that you are for a fifth grade student. And so um, there's going to need to be uh, different preparations. You know, when kids come back, there's going to need to be um, so a lot of dialogue with students about sanitizing and washing your hands and, you know, making sure that there's sanitizer and things like that and making sure that there's some kind of routine. And that looks very different for a kindergartner than it does for a fifth grader. And so, um, again, our, our staff um, has been fantastic. They want students back. Um, and, uh, and so it's really just about how do we um, come together to make it work and be safe. Um, that's the most important thing. So. So, um, again, our, our staff um, has been fantastic. They want to Other comments? Billy, do you have any questions? Okay, if there's no other questions. And, and again, I, I want to mention that um, the reason that there's an elementary waiver and not a secondary waiver, a middle school, high school waiver, is because, again, younger children are not good vectors to transmit the virus. Um, and there are pediatric cases, um, but in comparison, it's a lot lower than the adult cases or the, the you know, 10, 11 and up. Um, so uh, that's the, the reason why there's elementary waivers and not a secondary waiver. And, and I don't even know if there'll ever be a secondary waiver, to be honest with you. So 
I don't want to be doom and gloom, but it, it's going to be difficult to get a secondary waiver. Or even our cases continue to come down to that red, potentially, yeah. And that's why it's so important to stay masked up. Um, I know I'm not masked up right now, social distance, um, but it's very important to continue to mask up. And, and part of this plan is that everybody needs a mask up. And, um, you know, we need to continue that, not just in Dallas Palace, but throughout the county. And um, that basically dictates what color we are um, to be able to reopen schools and things like that. And so as numbers come down, um, the hospitalization rates go down, there's less deaths and we're safer and people feel more comfortable to come back to school. Um, and, uh, and so if we continue with that masking up and promoting masking up and making sure that we're being safe um, and those numbers continue to come down, um, then potentially, there, you know, the possibility of, of a secondary schools coming back, there's there's a possibility. But I, I do believe that we're going to need to go down a couple more colors to even have the opportunity to bring back secondary students. In in my personal opinion. So continue with that Other thoughts, questions? Anything that I missed? Then potentially, you know. Okay, if there's no other additional um, questions or comments, we will call for the vote. Mrs. Arias? Yes. Mr. Chase? Yes. Mr. Bonds? Yes. Mr. O'Banion? Oh, yes. Mr. Van Worth? Yeah. 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 Mr. Moraz? Yes. Yeah. And Mrs. Davis is a yes as well, and it passes. 9.1 adjourn yes, meeting. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding yes. the towers. Ask that question now. Ask that question now. Even though we already vote on it. By day. So you're saying, one mile, so you're saying one mile radius. Explain to me one mile radius. If this is a tower. If this is a tower. One mile out. One mile out and around, or is it half a mile? One mile is a mile. mile 360. So it's a mile out each way. Yes. So yes. It's a mile out each way. Yeah. So a mile, mile radius. So think of it like the R and the radius. It is a whole mile out. Yeah. Yeah. A mile out. Okay. Now, you said the yes, those are microwave shots, miles, and those are way more. Yeah, when me and Ms. Kapinski looked at that, the first initial numbers were right around 2.5 million, as Dr. Miller mentioned. I'm sorry. Well, that was for, that was for about three, yeah, three or four that towers only. Three, uh, three, three poles. The great thing about our district is we already have two existing poles, and so that's reducing the cost. But yeah, that was for uh, three, three towers. Uh, I, I don't have the exact number for you. So, yeah, but but yeah. Uh, Roughly. Just, um, so would two I, of those? Be I don't want to guesstimate on that. Uh, our numbers were were two two and a half simply because of putting stuff out in the Christian area in terms of microwave shots, and that was the the extra five hundred thousand, if you will. Because what I'm getting at, if you could have got two of those with a four mile radius. Versus three that we're getting now, we could have reached the way, and we could. The, the problem with that is, areas. is that again, that we're not you know, it's now. a money issue, which you know we don't want to overspend. Now you're overspending the lot, educational mitigation loss money. Well, well, right now we're at five, correct? Two. We're at five, five versus three, three. Six, six, we're we're six towers, yeah. And, this is for six. We're all all they're doing basically for our two existing tenants, they're gonna put radio station. They're gonna put my they're gonna put their frequencies on them. So that's the that's the reduction in cost. Those are the two existing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we went from again one million in comparison to two point five.
You're muted, Dr. Miller. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And this still gives us what we need. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's going to be 10% of the population that's not covered. Um, but at the same time, 90% is, is really good. And it's something that other communities, he mentioned Desert Sands and Patterson, but where else have you heard any other community have something like this? Yeah, yes. absolutely. That's true. That's very true. Mm -hmm. We would get reimbursed as approximately one million dollars or one five, one point two. So, but for the long term. Okay, so that's the short term and the long term, because technically this money is for short term uh, educational loss mitigation, and we have short term connectivity issues. And so that's why we're allocating it, but also it's going to benefit us five to 10 years out from now with federal money. Yes. Yes. Are there any more questions or comments? So we don't put this on the map breaking it. <laughs> the size of our community is what allows us to do this. We are small. I, guys, I, I'm just going to, my personal opinion, of, I, I hope this wasn't live, to be honest with you. It, it, I know, I know, I know, to be honest with you, I hope this wasn't live, but to get something like that in this district, trust me, I would, you just don't know how great that would be for the kids here and for the, for the, for the staff here. It's just, uh, you know, my 10 years of doing this, every district that I, that I went to, that was kind of like the vision for the next five, 10 years. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for a town this size. And I just cannot stress that enough. Your, this town being so small, being a 1.3 mile radius town allows this to happen. If you look at Patterson right now, they're already on cell tower two. And the feedback we get from them is, wow, this is something that is once again, an opportunity of a lifetime. They're taking advantage of that. You know, basically using similar companies that I reached out to for, for the quotes. The estimates and, and their their take on it is this is an awesome thing to do. Okay. Are there any other Dr. Miller, you're muted. If we had to pay the million dollars that we're not having to pay because we're using federal money to do it, this is something that we discussed without this money that we wanted to do. And so now that we have the opportunity and there's a timeline to it, it makes sense to do it. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of your opportunities when you have them. Are there any other questions or comments, Dr. Miller? I, yeah, I could, I could get a count. Uh, just, just by looking, just give you a, uh, to give you a rough estimate, our at t hotspots serve close to about uh, 100 kids. So there's about you know two or three kids per family sometimes on average. So you're talking at the very most, at the very most, um, two, three kids, 100. So at the very most, uh, 30 to 40, 50, 50 families the most in the outskirts. And these are families out in the outskirts. And so you're serving close to already 23, you know, basically 2,300 kids already with those numbers. Yeah. At a cost, even if it's just for the bill, if we can afford it, it's worth investing. It's a good investment. If we had a million dollars, which we're not, we're not having a million I'm sorry, I have the delay. Are, are there any more questions or concerns? Now that we have the opportunity and a timeline to it, it makes sense to do it. We don't. Are we ready to adjourn? Yes. 9.1 adjourn meeting. I need a motion and a second. Motion. Moved by Mr. O'Banion. Moraz. Second by Mr. Moraz. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.